Good morning, everyone. I'm Katherine Honeycutt, the Communications Specialist for BBB, and I am pleased to welcome you to our Business Builders webinar, Hospitality Best Practices. During today's webinar, Dave Clough, a certified trainer and CEO of Your Hospitality Resource Group, will share hospitality best practices that every business owner needs to know. Just some housekeeping before we begin. If you have any questions throughout the webinar, please put them in the chat box and we'll be sure to get to them um, during the presentation. Without further delay, we will dive into today's webinar. Dave, I'll pass it off to you to get us started. All right, well, uh, good morning, everybody, and thank you, Catherine. I appreciate uh, the opportunity to be able to, to join and share my thoughts and information with everybody. Um, so today, we're gonna be talking about hospitality best practices, primarily um, training, and how training can generate a profit, all right? So let me tell you a little bit about uh, myself and why I became passionate about training. As mentioned, my name is Dave Club. I'm the owner of Your Hospitality Resource Group, uh, we embrace an honest, positive, and, um, for, let's see, there we go. My thing isn't turning. Why is my thing? I am so sorry. <laughs> Get my slides going here. There we go. Now we're good. I am so sorry about that, folks. A little technical difficulty there. All right. Um, as mentioned, my name is Dave Klopp. I'm the owner of Your Hospitality Resource Group. Uh, we embrace an honest, positive, and productive uh, attitude in the areas of training and quality service. We specialize in helping individuals and companies grow in a variety of areas that will generate a positive impact on every guest experience. Um, we offer server training, bar training, uh, bartending 101 course, and bar staffing. I recently have been recertified uh, as a surf safe instructor, and I'm working on getting materials together so I can begin teaching this course as well. My core instruction of over 10 years has been tips training, which I'm, I'm extremely passionate about. Uh, we'll talk about that a little bit later. But you see, the reason why I'm so passionate about that is because approximately 80,000 people die each year due to alcohol, making it the third leading cause, third leading cause of preventable death. Uh, if this training can save just one life, resulting from a seller, um, server, or bartender being more informed and responsible, then I've made an impact and will continue to do so for as long as I'm able. In my 30 plus years in the industry, I've come to a common theme, um, and that's incons inconsistency with training. Uh, many places get it right, but there are many more who do not, including places I've worked. I have uh, seen establishments suffer and even close due to their priorities not being in the right place. Although there are several reasons why this might happen, it is my strong belief that without consistent quality training, nothing else will work. You have an amazing chef that begins the experience, but if your front of the house staff is not trained to keep the experience going, you will lose your customers and eventually your business. Training will help ensure that every experience will get positive reactions from your guests and you'll become a profitable business. My passion for giving people a positive experience began when I was 16. I was a jungle cruise skipper at Walt Disney World in Florida. I didn't really think about the impact I was making on people's lives until I visited my mom in Virginia. She was introducing me to people in her office and eventually introduced me to her boss. When she opened the door for me to walk in, her boss jumped up and said, Jungle Dave, he remembered me. Um, my mom and I were both shocked. He remembered me from being his jungle cruise skipper uh, while on vacation. So uh, at that moment, I realized that what you do in life will affect others in a way that you can never imagine. Imagine how many smiles I put on people's faces, how many photos and videos I must be in from family vacations, how many kids were able to go back and tell their friends that they got to drive the jungle cruise boat. This is where my passion began, and I continue this into my career of serving people. What people are going to remember most is, is their experience. If I can help teach that to others who want to be successful, that's even a greater feeling. For this discussion, we'll cover four areas, customer service, serve, uh, serving safe food, alcohol responsibility, and of course, COVID-19, and how these areas are affecting your business and the hospitality industry, and why training is key in all of these areas. We'll begin today with uh, customer service. Providing great customer service is essential for anyone in the hospitality industry to survive. Customer service is not about how well your knowledge is, how fancy your location is, or even how great your food and drinks are. It is about attitude and personality you have towards the people who come to you in your establishment. It's about the customers being treated like they were the best guests you would ever invite into your own home and making them feel welcomed. 
It's about the answer always being yes. Now, what is the question? Money is reactions, not transactions. You need your guests to want to come back. If you think of transactions purely as financial exchanges, you are missing a big piece of the picture. Every transaction you have with the public should be a building block in a long and profitable relationship. Every transaction must feel personable. Uh, if you want them to lead, and if you want them to lead to repeat customers, referrals, and community acceptance, make every transaction be a result of a positive reaction, and you will be successful. And who better to make those positive reactions happen with your guests than your staff? Well, let me explain. When the owner or manager looks at the profit and loss statement and they see that they're not generating the sales to make a profit and even possibly losing money, one of the first things they think about is cutting labor. In doing this, the remaining staff are working harder for the same pay. Cutting labor doesn't change the number of customers you have coming in the door. So now you have disgruntled employees because of the workload they have. When they approach your guests, do you think that they'll have a positive attitude? Do you think that they'll have the mentality to go above and beyond and make that guest want to come back? Now you look at the profit and loss uh, sheet and you um, pull the rest of your hair out, kind of like mine, <laughs> uh, trying to figure out why you're still losing money. You then begin to look at how to cut your food costs and look for less expensive ways to, pr um, uh, to produce your product, which could change your great menu items to mediocre menu items. You might consider offering coupons or discounts to try to drive business. This may work temporarily, but eventually it will make it harder to maintain your food costs and profitability. All of this could have been avoided if you had only invested in your staff first. The best restaurants have happy and well-trained staff, which is why you do not see a lot of discounts or coupons in those places. By training the staff to genuinely care for every person that comes into your establishment, you will better the chances of guests returning. I worked for a GM many years ago that would actually tell you that if you're having things going on in your personal life, that would affect how you interact with the guests, I'd rather you call off, you'd rather just, you just call off. You see, he knows that there are tons of places that he is competing with for that customer, and if he could establish a relationship with each customer through his staff, they would become regulars and invite their family and friends. Another example happened just a few nights ago. My family and I had walked into a restaurant where the host was very pleasant, got us a table, and said the server would be right with us. They were not terribly busy it was near, as it was near closing time, um, we must have waited about at least five minutes before the server even stopped by, and the very first words out of his mouth were, quote, the kitchen closes in 12 minutes. Never did he say hello, didn't ask if we wanted anything to drink, didn't bring us water, nothing. His demeanor was that he really did not want us, uh, he didn't really want to be there. Uh, the food was fantastic. Man, the food was really good. And the atmosphere was very enjoyable. I watched other servers as they were taking care of the late tables who had a great personality and visited their tables at least 50% more than our server did. I'm not saying that any other time he would have not have been a great server, but at that moment, and with his first words when approaching our table, it affected my experience. It was why my family and I would think twice about returning. Always be consistent with superior service and deliver on it every time. It is one thing to be surprised by great service, but to get great service every time will help get people coming back a second and third time. When people walk into your place for the first time and have a great experience, fewer than 50% will return because the establishment may not be the right fit for them. So no one positive experience does, make, um, does not make a steady customer. However, the second time a person visits your place, there is a 50% 50 chance, 50 chance that they will return. The third time, there's a 70% chance that they will return. So always shoot for the third visit returning customer through consistency. Increasing frequency by just one visit a month increases revenue up 12%. In our industry, you will hear that the customer always comes first, all right? It has always been my policy that employees must come first. When you hire your staff, you hire someone who you think has a great personality, outgoing and great with people. Those same people can hurt, uh, <clears throat> sorry, those same people can hurt you if they're not happy. They are in, they are in the tip industry. So rather than expecting a raise from you, they would much rather have the tools and systems in place that will help them make more money and tips. Training, training gives them that. Make the time to ensure that they are getting training and quality customer service that will help them generate more money and tips. Training should be cons uh, constant, whether it is a one-line um, one line reminder during a shift or having daily shift meetings prior to the staff being, beginning their shifts. You should always include a customer service segment in your new hire training. 
spend a few dollars by buying the winner of a contest, lunch, movie tickets, or anything that will uh, create a fun atmosphere while practicing the things you taught them so they can help increase your revenue, your profits, and more money for them. Train them on the art of upselling and um, complimenting an order. For example, if uh, someone orders a vodka martini in your well vodka Smirnoff, teach them to say something like, yum, that sounds good. Would you like to have absolute or Tito's with that? Or if someone orders a pasta dish, would you like to try a nice glass of Merlot or Pinot Noir with that? Now ch the check average is higher for a higher tip for them, and you just added a little bit more to your bottom line. Now check this out. Not only are you looking at your profit and loss report to see the increase in sales, you are also seeing that some of your other numbers are in line as well. You will see some, you will see some money is being saved in operating expenses because your turnover is low. Your staff who invested, who you invested your time and training in are happy and are sticking around to take care of the place where they enjoy working. With that kind of atmosphere, you can't go wrong. These are some of the examples <clears throat> of some of the things I use in training. Um, this is something I put together for NC State, the service standards, um, maintaining good posture, always try to look at attention. Um, I don't know how many times, because they have a lot of you know uh, younger folks that have never really been in this industry before. They don't think what they're chewing gum or they're eating or doing something in front of the guests. Um, be courteous, efficient, and quiet. So th this is just a, a list that I put together um, as part of my training. Um, I, we also go over and try to um, help them as far as handling requests. I don't know how aggravating it is when you're um, at a table and you are uh, you need something and you can't find your server, you can't find your waiter. So if if anybody is walking by that table, they should feel that they could be able to handle that table, even though it's not their table. Find out what their requests are. So and then get to you know if you don't have time to do it, ask another server or get a manager involved to help that guest. The bottom line is that we want to make sure service standards are being met. Um, all the way across the board. So this is something else that I, that I teach in the course as well. And then follow these steps to ensure great customer service. Uh, know your product or service. This is huge. Um, I always encourage the kitchen staff, uh, especially when they're doing um, new items, new menu items, to um, have a little meeting um, with the staff and give them, give them a taste. Give them a taste of what that item's like. Let them see what it looks like so they can describe it to the guests and, uh, when, they, when they come in. Um, and say, what specials do you have? Well, we're promoting this, this, and this, and man, it was really good. We had a chance to try it today, et cetera, et cetera. So it's huge. And it gets, also gives the chefs and the, you know, the back of the house and the front of the house an opportunity to work really well together, too, and doing that. It's also important to make sure that they know if there's going to be any kind of allergen-type issues with that particular food product. So this is a great opportunity to you know, make sure that the, the, the servers are knowing the product. You know, be friendly, say thank you, train your staff. I can't emphasize that enough. Uh, it's constant, constant training. And then, of course, some others is there as well. Okay, so <clears throat> while the front of the house is the face uh, customer C, customer service includes everyone from the maintenance crew to the cooks in the kitchen. Clean restrooms, good food, and a friendly, inviting atmosphere are all components of good customer service in which every employee plays a role. Now, depending on, on which client I'm working with, um, you know, if you've got a host or a hostess and stuff, I really put a lot of emphasis on that because that's the first person people see when they walk into the door. <clears throat> so the first impact can make or break you 110%. And then, of course, everyone else is one big happy team. Nothing can be done without the other. The servers are like, well, you know, we, we're the ones that bring the people in. We're the ones that get the return customers. Well, that's partly true. But it's also the great food that the chefs put out. It's also the, the atmosphere of the restaurant that the managers establish. It's all of those things. All right. So the industry is about building a genuine relationships. The culture is to challenge your, is a challenge your uh, uh, yourself to strive and improve by consistently evaluating every aspect of the operation, both front and back of the house. All right, the tangible part should be easy, second nature, making sure that you know you're, you've got uh, nice looking linen and china and silverware plentiful and in good condition. Uniforms are stylish and not outdated, which I'm so glad to see that we're not wearing the tuxedo shirts anymore. Uh, training and, uh, and steps of service should be set up so that the front and the back of the house are coordinated and working together as one. We just talked about that. Focusing on consistency for every guest, every course, every meal, every day. Our guests need to leave saying that was incredible. All right. 
let's move on to serving a safe food. All right. Um, the other thing you want to do is to ensure that your guests are feeling safe and comfortable in your establishment. This is so important that North Carolina, as in many other states, every food establishment must have at least one manager who is certified on the premise anytime the establishment is open for business. The purpose for this is to ensure that food safety is always being practiced for the safety of your staff and guests. Serve safe certification is mandatory and is regulated by the health department. If you are not practicing the proper steps to ensure the food safety in your establishment, you risk the possibility of having your doors closed. The health department will periodically perform inspections that you will be graded on. These scores must be posted where your guests can see. If you have a low score, your guests will be able to see that and could make the decision to leave and not come back. It will show them that you're not taking the necessary steps to ensure the safety and you will, lose, you will have lost that, that revenue. They in turn will turn to their friends and tell their friends who, you know, the, the scores and what's going on and who could tell their friends and they'll tell their friends and so on. Even worse, this is also public record which anyone can see at wakegov.com for Wake County as an example. Earlier we, talk, earlier we talked about training your staff to offer great customer service. This is another area where training is so, so important. If everyone is being trained to follow the proper guidelines and ensure food safety, you will pass your inspections with flying colors, serve safe products, and keep people safe. People will want uh, to keep coming back because you nailed 100% on your food safety inspection, which is posted. Believe it or not, your customers will notice. Ask my son. It's one of the first things he looks at. Maybe it's because dad is in the business. <laughs> I don't know, but he's always looking at that. All right. Um, here's just some things that Safe Surf covers. Um, basic food safety, personal hygiene, cross-contamination and allergens, time and temperature, uh, and cleaning and sanitation. Um, this is, uh, I, I talk about NC State a little bit, they're, they're one of my clients and uh, I do a lot of training and stuff for them, but uh, this is one of the things that we go over in training uh, with food labels. They do a lot of buffets, well, before COVID, they were doing a lot of buffets and, uh, uh, you know, it was very important that we put things like this out there so people can see that, you know, if they've got a nut allergy, then they're not going to be able to enjoy this really good banana walnut loaf, you know, so... Um, we go over this uh, food labels and why they're so important. Um, food allergens. Um, I got another another uh, way to handle with guest allergens. We, we want to make sure that the staff knows how to deal with that. We want to make sure the staff, you know, is knowledgeable and say and know that you know this particular item has this. And if if someone comes up and says they have a question, how should they respond to that? You know, um, hopefully they'll be able to provide answers. But if not, they need to know where to go and where to get the information. Um, and to make sure that uh, everybody is okay. All right. Just we, I can't emphasize drive it home, drive it home, drive it home. Make sure the staff understands that they could save a life just by knowing what just the eight major allergens are. You know, just just knowing these um, can help save someone's life and making sure someone's not eating something that they shouldn't be eating. Um, so it's so so important that 48 million, 48 million Americans get sick from foodborne illnesses every year. That's one in six. There are 128,000 hospitalizations and 3,000 deaths annually. So following the guidelines that are set in place, we can bring these numbers down to prevent the transmission of salmonella, listeria, E. coli, hepatitis A, and the norovirus. All right, this training, I can't emphasize this, this training is so important, it should be ongoing and discussed every day, okay? All right, this is something I'm really passionate about. This is kind of what got me started um, with a bartending background that I have, um, and that's responsible alcohol training. All right, this is, this is where my, this is, I, I just can't emphasize a passion with this. And we'll talk about that in just a second. But here are just a few, here are just a few numbers to reflect why um, responsible alcohol training is important. Just in North Carolina, and these are 2018, but just in North Carolina, um, North Carolina was the seventh worst state for drunk driving in the country. 27,000, almost 28,000 DUI arrests. All right. Out of that, 141 of those folks. Dave, are you there? I think you froze. Were under the influence of, um, at 18 years. Oh, I'm here. Can you hear me? Now I hear you. Yep. Okay. Sorry about that. No problem. All right. Um, so are we caught up with the North Carolina? Yes. <laughs> okay, yep. great, great. 
So this is basically just shows that, you know, how, how serious this, 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 this is and why I've become so passionate about, about uh, addressing the, the responsible alcohol training. Um, we, we've got to save lives. And these numbers, these numbers are just the drivers. These, this doesn't include all the other people that were affected or died because of a, someone who's uh, under the influence. So, um, all right. So, therefore, I chose, let's see here. There's a few organizations that will teach responsible alcohol training, all of which offer great information and help inform people on how to be more informed when selling and serving alcohol. At this point, I would say that any training is better than no training. But if you're going to invest time and money into a program, be sure to choose one that will generate the best results. Do not pick one just because it's free or if it's low cost, it, because it could cost you more in the end. Many lack the accountability piece that ensures comprehension of the material. Some don't, there's no discussion, there's no role playing that would encourage participation from everyone. There's no question and answer section, no review, and no test that must be passed to ensure the knowledge is there. Having all these things will only enforce the safe service of alcohol and protect your liability. So of all the programs that are out there, I chose to work with Health Communications Inc., who founded TIPS, which stands for Training for Intervention Procedures. It is a nationally recognized program that teaches anyone who sells and serves alcohol, how to do so more, more responsibly. This class is about five hours long and is incredibly detailed in discussing alcohol and its effects and effective server responses. We then spend quite a bit of time for the class, probably most of the class, doing skills training where we are evaluating cues of guests and then more skills training where we are evaluating the responses of the servers. This is an area of much discussion and participation. We then have a practice session with role playing, a review, and then a test, which must be passed with a 70% or better. All right, here's just some of the examples of uh, state laws and regulations we, and, and check-in IDs that we cover in a section of this course. Um, this is uh, the North Carolina laws and regulations. What I do before every single club, before every single course, the last thing I do is I'm preparing for everything, is I go online and I make sure I get the most updated um, laws and regulations summary. Um, you know, so the, it covers all the things that we need to go over, you know, the age to pour, the age to sell and those kind of things. But I want to make sure that it's, it's completely updated, uh, most recently updated so that, uh, uh, we're, we're, I'm given the most updated information. It's just, uh, uh, laws are changing all the time. So we just want to make sure that we're giving them good information. And of course, hours of sales, we talk, uh, we spend some time on, um, I check in IDs and underage persons. In fact, one of the things we do is, when checking IDs, we, we discuss the FEAR method, which is uh, feel, examine, ask, and return. So, <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> so anyway, um, we go into a lot of detail about that. We even have a, we even have a little uh, um, uh, fun with saying, you know, can you guess how old these people are? And we've got about eight or ten you know, pictures and, and we have to, they have to guess how old these people are just to show that age is deceiving. So I hope I look younger than I really am. <laughs> so anyway, um, so um, I've been an instructor for over 10 years. I've received letters from Ohio State, uh, Ohio's uh, Governor John Kasich and Ohio Senator Rob uh, Portman acknowledging the work I've done teaching tips. Tips has received recognition from insurance companies, liquor boards, and law enforcement agencies all over the country. It will improve customer service through responsible service of alcohol, which also makes for safer communities. It protects your liability for reducing the exposure to alcohol liability lawsuits. And then it can also lower your insurance premiums, which can more than cover the cost of training. Some of the largest jury awards in the United States involved establishments that are overserved alcohol. If your establishment fails to serve alcohol responsibly, you could lose millions. TIPS provides a reasonable effort defense in court and is proven effective in reducing alcohol-related instances such as drunk driving, underage drinking, intoxication, and alcohol-related property uh, damage. Uh, as a result, many insurance carriers either require TIPS or offer discounts on premiums to establishments that have certified TIPS participants on staff. So consider what it would cost you if you were found liable for an alcohol-related incident. A few hundred dollars for training could save thousands in lawsuits and damages, not to mention the money lost in lost revenue when your liquor license is suspended or revoked. Even worse, the cost of someone's life because of negligence and not making a reasonable effort and being responsible. 
Organizations spend tons of money to sell and serve the best products and services to be better than the competition. Why would you cut corners when it comes to giving your organization the best opportunity to keep people safe by having a well-trained staff? All right. So while offering training, when I do a lot of my training, I have been known to bring a box of soap and occasionally stand on it and inform students that, quote, I'm standing on my soapbox to share my views about a subject uh, and that while it's only my opinion, it's, it's something I'm passionate about and why I do what I do. So please bear with me as I share my views. Well, I'm, I'm not going to let you guys off the hook. You're going to hear my soapbox moment that I'm most passionate about. And there's a reason why I'm doing this. The state of North Carolina, as well as 20 other states, do not mandate responsible alcohol training for all who sell and serve alcohol. Currently, the, state, uh, the law states that the holder of the license is the only one mandated to take a responsible alcohol training course. Now, how many owners of bars and restaurants are in their operations from open to close, ensuring that, that managers and staff are being responsible in the service of alcohol? Very few. Nobody wants to work those kind of hours. Open to close, seven days a week. It's not going to happen. The state of North Carolina mandates through the National Restaurant Association that every operation which serves food have a certified manager with ServSafe certification on premise during the entire time the operation is open for business. When the health inspector shows up and the manager on duty does, does, um, manager on duty does not have the certification, they will automatically fail without question. They do this because food safety and people's lives are that important. Why would alcohol safety and people's lives not be equally important? This is a passion of mine, and I was in the process of connecting with the state legislature about my concerns. Then COVID-19 was upon us, and the priorities needed to change. So I'm not going to give up. We just, we've just kind of paused a little bit here. When I discuss the laws with people, I remind them that they cannot change the law, but they can better the law as long as they don't discriminate. So in this case, and this is where everybody comes in, in this case, you can mandate your establishment requires responsible alcohol training, even though it's not required by the state. It is up to you to incorporate skills and expertise in a positive, meaningful, and profitable way by training your staff in responsible alcohol service. And then I'm off my soapbox. Mic drop, all that good fun stuff. <laughs> all right, so let's move on to COVID-19. Oh my goodness, the new normal. So currently there is no evidence to support transmission of COVID-19 by food. Unlike foodborne viruses like norovirus and hepatitis A, COVID-19 is a virus that causes respiratory illness. It's transmitted mainly from person to person, typically through respiratory droplets from coughing, sneezing, or talking. Another way is by touching objects that may contain the virus and then touching their own mouth, nose, or eyes. Due to the nature of how easily and quickly it's contracted, guidelines and measures were implemented to try and reduce the spread and keep people safe. Like many other viruses, if measures are not taken to prevent or even slow the spread, the risk become greater of sickness and death, especially for high-risk people, such as the elderly and people with pre-existing conditions. All right, this is how important this is. All right, millions of people without jobs. So COVID-19, there's no win scenario. Um, three, this is uh, uh, the numbers as of July 18th, so just a few days ago. You know, um, 3,630,000 total cases in the United States. Of that, 138,000 uh, total deaths. Now, I think it's closer to 140 now, but uh, those are, those are just, uh, just crazy numbers. Millions, like I said, without jobs. So, prior to this pandemic, the restaurant and bars were doing really well. In fact, restaurants alone are a driving force in North Carolina's economy. They provide jobs and build careers for thousands of people and play a vital role in the communities throughout the state. Uh, eating and drinking locations in North Carolina. There are almost 482,000 restaurants and food service jobs in North Carolina, which is about 11% of the employment in the state. And by 2029, that number is projected to grow by 13% and will be, uh, which will add another 64,000 jobs. All right. So what does that look like for North Carolina? $21.4 billion was the estimated sales of North Carolina's restaurant in restaurant sales uh, for 2018. $21.4 billion, all right? Every dollar spent in table service restaurants contributes $1.89 to the state economy. Every dollar spent in limited service, the counter service type restaurants, contribute $1.68 to the state economy, all right? 
And then you have the bars, the breweries, the wineries, and you're talking even more revenue for the state, all right? To keep people safe and save lives, the CDC established risk factor guidelines, all right? The more an individual interacts with others and the longer that interaction, the higher the risk of COVID-19 spread, all right? And over to the right there on the slide, it's got lower risk, more risk, et cetera, et cetera. So these are some of the guidelines that were put in place, all right? Um, all right, so that being said, more than 370,000 people in North Carolina hospitality industry are out of work right now. 500,000 jobs were eliminated, um, not just restaurants, but people involved around the restaurants and stuff, jobs just being eliminated. These people have no work and are struggling to survive. Many people think that North Carolina is against the restaurants uh, in the hospitality industry and are taking it personal. They do not understand that North Carolina is losing money as well. What did I say? 20 $1.4 billion, a lot of money. It's not in their best interest, right? So they didn't, uh, So we know that it's not in the best interest for the state to keep everything closed or even a 50% capacity. For North Carolina, it has and should always be about safety. North Carolina wants the restaurants and bars to be open as they are losing money as well. The concern is safety for the people of North Carolina. How can this be done and what can be done to monitor that safety measures are being met? The challenge is how do you ensure that safety protocols are being met in the atmosphere where people congregate, dance, get close to talk over loud music, et cetera, and do so in large groups and numbers. I was, in Virginia, I was in Virginia Beach a few days ago and was really impressed with some of the bars on the Strip. Uh, they had someone standing outside monitoring how many people were going inside, had tables spaced out, had limited seats at the bar, and spots blocked off to control people coming up to the bar. I felt comfortable as um, a guest having a beer. The problem is inconsistency. Not every owner is responsible and will enforce the guidelines re recommended by the state. It is the old school mentality where it takes a few to ruin it for everyone. If you're gonna be part of the solution, then you are, if, I'm sorry. <laughs> if you're not gonna be part of the solution, then you are part of the problem. Therefore, I encourage my clients to please do the right thing when they open so that they can hopefully stay open. Encourage others to follow the guidelines so that everyone can open under normal circumstances sooner than later. So um, this is a great um, uh, slide here. The CDC.gov uh, is where you'll find this for restaurants and bars. Um, you know, it's a little checklist to see if you're ready to do, to, to, to get open. Um, so should you consider opening? If you can check both of those, you move over to the next, the next section. Are you recommended? Um, are recommended health and safety actions in place. If not one of those things, if, if one of those things, even one of them is missing, well then you need to stop and you need to meet the safeguards first before you can move on. So this is, this is a pretty cool little thing to get started with, all right? Um, <clears throat> the biggest thing is to make sure that you are following the CDC um, uh, and state guidelines for reopening and then follow it. Here are some examples. Uh, staying home when appropriate, hand hygiene and respiratory etiquette, cloth uh, face coverings, wearing the mask. You know, I, I know it's, a, it's, nobody likes doing that, but what is worth wearing a mask or wearing a respirator? You know, I mean, it's just, it just makes sense. And of course, this is the guidelines. If you want to open up your business, you've got to follow these guidelines, at least right now anyway. So um, these are uh, some, uh, some and, and then maintaining healthy environments, cleaning and disinfection. Um, shared objects, ventilation. I was impressed. I had uh, walked into a, a restaurant. I, I'm trying to support the local restaurants as much as I can, and I was really impressed. They had a sign up on the wall talking about the ventilation system. I was like, wow, that's really cool. So, um, physical barriers and that kind of stuff. All right. Um, maintaining healthy operations. Again, protections for employees at higher risk, regulatory awareness. Make sure you know what the CDC laws are and things like that. You know, so. Um, communication system, um, what's your leave policy and time off policy for staff, um, you know, especially ones that are not feeling well um, and may have some of the symptoms. Staff training, staff training, staff training, that's included almost in everything that I, that I talk about, all right? And then preparing for sick employees, you know, let them know that, hey, it's okay to stay home. We'd rather you stay home and get better than to, you know, to, to you know, jeopardize, you know, your safety and making things worse by you going out to work and then, of course, the safety of others, um, you know, clean and disinfect. And, you know, they talk about notifying the health officials. And that's if you've got like several employees, like multiple employees there, you know, gotten the, 
you know, the, the, the virus and stuff, you want to make sure you let, let somebody know about that. So um, they can make sure that everything's going to be done properly and do and, and, and correctly. So uh, I'm seeing some restaurants who are following the guidelines to the T and others are not concerned at all. No social distancing, no mask, et cetera. One employee even said, I'm not wearing a mask unless the authorities come in and tell me to. The chances of them having COVID-19 might have been slim, but what if, and what does that tell me, the customer? How do they really feel about my safety? I could have been high risk. They don't know. What if I had COVID-19 and now I'm jeopardizing them? It works both ways. Not only will they lose a sale, but they could lose business moving forward. People are going to support the establishments that are following the guidelines, and that's what I do when I go out. If I don't see these things being followed, I'm not going to I'm not going to go to that establishment, and they're going to lose sales. You know, well, my sales, but anybody else who feels the way I do. Once again, though, folks, it's all about training. If you train your team to follow the guidelines, people will feel safe and will frequent your establishment during these times more than others. You will have more business and more sales that will help keep you going until things get reopened. Establish a checklist to prepare for opening. Um, if you guys want to put in the chat box at any time during this presentation your email information, um, I'll be more than happy to send you. Uh, the CDC has a really detailed um, uh, opening checklist for getting your establishment open. And it's not just for people in the restaurant industry. In fact, it's for everybody. Uh, except for the people in the medical field, I think is the only thing. But it's really hard to to print that up. They didn't make it real easy. So what I did for you is I went ahead and, and fixed that, and I, I I I I made a PDF file so that if there's something you guys are interested in, I'll be more than happy to send you. Um, just like I said, drop your information in the in the um, in the chat, and um, and we'll go from there. Um, let's see here. Uh, then establish one that keeps you going. So again, this is for restaurants and bars because that's primarily a lot of the people that I do I work with. Um, this is a real good thing that you can put on your clip, clipboard. You got the, you know, your opening, your mid manager, your closing manager, or, or you know, uh, or maybe an opening and closing manager. But this this ensures you that as you're doing your walkthroughs and you got this on your little clipboard or in the back of your mind somewhere, you know, you can check to make sure that you're still doing all the things that you need to be doing constantly throughout the day so that you can stay open and stay in compliance with the CDC and keeping people safe. All right. Uh, let's see here. Follow the guidelines that are in place for reopening, which you can get at uh, the uh, nc.gov um, COVID uh, forward slash COVID-19. And then if you go to the cdc.gov, um, uh, they, uh, they'll have a big, huge banner right on the very first page that you go there that uh, says COVID-19. And from there, you'll be able to find all the resources you need for your for your business, your industry. Uh, there are some great sources. These are some great sources, and that will help you be successful as possible under these conditions. All right, so here's my message and why I say all the things that I say, all right, to the bars. Uh, start preparing and training to be ready. Keep fighting to get open, all right? Trust me. Everybody, I mean, people want to get open. We want you to open. It's in North Carolina's best interest, right? So keep fighting to get open, but take the fight to the people and the businesses who are not following the guidelines. It's not the state, it's the people and the businesses that are not following the guidelines that's making this happen, and, and that is keeping your establishment closed. Remember, the state wants you to reopen, they're losing tons and tons of money, all right? So throughout this presentation, I'm sure you're seeing a pattern, training, it must start with you, and I, can't guarantee, and I can guarantee that you will see the success. Training in the hospitality industry should never be an option. In fact, training in any industry should be a, a part of all business plans and a permanent line item on your P&L. I always said that the more sales you have, the easier it will be to manage your P&L in a profitable way. More sales are generated from your well-trained and happy team. So invest in your team daily and watch your profits grow. Don't let, I just, I just can't emphasize that enough. I mean, people say, I don't have the money or the time to train. Well. You, you you need to you need to find the time and find the money to train because without that training all of these uh, all of these things will, will present problems for you and uh, we're, we want you to be successful so um, and that's all I got um, I thank you very much for your time um, if there's any questions and uh, we'll go from there oh and here's my information and let's see here there it is
Awesome. Thank you so much, Dave, um, for just your insight there. And as a reminder to everyone, if you have any questions, you can put them in the chat box at this time. Um, I do want to ask, you know, you talked a lot about hospitality um, in regards to restaurants and the food industry, but, you know, I'm sure hospitality is important in any, any industry. So can you talk a little bit about you know, why would someone maybe not in the food industry also benefit from having high hospitality standards and implementing some of the things that you mentioned throughout your presentation? Well, I think that a lot of the stuff that I talk about um, was geared towards the, the restaurant and bar industry because that's kind of my, my client base for the most part and what I'm, and what I'm doing and stuff. But Everything that we that I talk about with regards to hospitality and how you treat your your customers and and uh, I, I say guests when it, when I'm in the hospitality industry, but anybody else you know it could be customers. Um, but you you want them to um, you want to make sure that they come back. You want to build loyalty and you want to build. Um, oh, what's the word I'm looking for? I'm losing the word. But you. you, you I'll give you a good example. There was a brief time when I had um, I was trying to get out of the hospita hospitality industry because of the hours and everything that was going on, and I and I had a newborn child, and I was like, well, maybe I'll do something different. So I got into sales. I was working for you know a company that uh, had a lot of competition and whatnot, and I had to go in and, and do a do a presentation uh, to see if I could make this make this sale for something that they needed. And I also noticed that my competition was out in the parking lot getting ready to leave. <laughs> so I immediately it just made me think about what I'm going to say and what I'm going to do. Because I know that I wasn't offering, what I was offering wasn't the cheapest. I mean, in fact, it was definitely going to be more than what they, I'm sure the, my competition was offering. So I told them, I said, you know, make sure that you compare apples to apples. Make sure that you're checking to, to, to you know, to, this is what I offer. I have this, 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 and this, you know, the other companies do that. You know, I'm not going to be the cheapest. If you're looking to be, to be the cheapest, if you're looking to save money or whatever, then, then definitely go with them. You know, at the end of the day, they did go with them, but then they end up calling me back and saying, you know, Dave, I'm sorry, we shouldn't have gone with them. We're going to bring you back. My point to that, I guess, is that, you know, I build relationships and that's what, that's what this is all about is building relationships. You build relationships with people and you're honest with people and not just, not just try to go for the sale. You know, maybe your numbers are down. I, I hate to say anything about the car industry because I, I love my cars, so don't get me wrong. But there are some people in the car industry that will, you know, it's all about, hey, I got to put food to the table. Let's get this car sold, you know, or our numbers are down. Let's push these sales. Well, I'm going to end up being top salesman because I'm going to build relationships. I might not have all my sales maybe in this month. I might not have made it, but then I blew them out of the water next month because I built those relationships. So I guess that's the number one thing I would encourage any industry to do is just build relationships and be honest with folks and, and they'll, it, it'll come. The money will come. Yeah, great point. And that kind of reminds me, you know, over the past couple months with COVID and everything that's been going on, a lot of those in-person interactions have been limited. So, you know, what advice do you have for ensuring that hospitality is still top of mind and, um, you know, maybe that you're still providing that great experience, but maybe in other ways, you know, now we have maybe it's online, maybe it's a phone call, or we have takeout and delivery options. You know, what, what are your thoughts there of making sure that that experience, you know, is the same whether I used to go in person and eat, obviously I can't have that atmosphere if I'm ordering takeout, but how might I as a business owner be able to apply that, you know, across multiple communication channels that now many businesses are having to navigate? Yeah, that's a great question. It's, um, it's, uh, it, it, I guess the best way to answer that is you embrace the attitude. You know, in your training, if you if you're teaching people, um, it, if you're teaching people to, to have the positive attitude and have a great attitude and and be able to to, to present that in everything that they do, um, be positive and 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 that kind of stuff, then then I think that that's going to transform into other things. Uh, as an example, um, you know, you. It's crazy. I was just talking about this the other day, how, you know, you're watching all these little talk shows and stuff on TV and you see that, you know, the, 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 the there's, there's some people will dress up in a suit and tie and other people are in their t-shirt and they got their hair all messed up and things like that, you know? And I was like, you know, what is that really saying? You know, I mean, because, you know, I'm sure they got a comb and they can comb their hair and stuff. What is that really saying about, you know, your audience and, and what you're trying to do and stuff? You know, I mean, I, I don't get that, but, 
Um, if you've got the good attitude and, and, and dress for success, even if you're on the phone, if, if, you're, if you're just doing phone work, if all you're doing is making doing phone calls and stuff like that, still put on a nice shirt, still, you know, wear pants and not sweatpants or something like that, because it'll, it'll, it'll change your attitude, it'll change your mentality. And, and that's just my opinion. It just, you know, it changes the way you think. You're not as laid back and you're not as relaxed or, um, uh, when you're talking to a customer um, because the customers, they, they've got real questions. They've got real things that they're, they're interested in. They want to talk to you about. And if they're talking to somebody that's really laid back and relaxed and that kind of stuff, it may not work for somebody that's, that, hey, look, you know, I'm just, I, w I want a little bit of professionalism here. I want a little bit of, you know, that, that um, I don't know. Uh, so it's just, to me, it's just the attitude, you know, uh, that you can transform. Uh, the other thing with regards to takeout and stuff, I mean, a, another great example, we had a real bad experience with this one restaurant that was not totally prepared for Mother's Day, was not prepared at all. And they, uh, uh, they had, it was just absolutely crazy where you can call ahead. It's just, it's just a long story. I won't get into it, but it was just, they, they were definitely not prepared. And a lot of people were upset. And uh, I guarantee they've lost a lot of sales um, in the future because people won't go back because they weren't prepared. They didn't think this through. So again, that's where training stuff comes in. But we went to another restaurant because we just said we can't do this. So we went to another restaurant um, and it was a smaller restaurant and it was um, not as fancy and, and whatnot, um, but they had it right. I mean, it was raining. They had, they had uh, the tents out for people. They had everything all reached out. They were friendly. They had people with umbrellas run into the car, making it, making it you know, really easy for everybody. Um, I don't know. It was, just, it was just above and beyond to the point where I actually called the company um, the next day and, and just rant and raved about how great everything was and how great the service was. And the attitudes of the people, they were smiling. I mean, you can hear that in someone's voice too. When they're on the phone, you can hear, you can hear somebody smile on the phone. Maybe it's just me, I don't know, but I really believe that. <laughs> yeah, that's a great point. And, and actually, it's a good segue into this thought of providing feedback, whether it's positive or negative. You know, <clears throat> in your experience in the hospitality industry, what's the best way to go about that? You know, should you let them know when you're right there in the moment? Should you wait and call them later, put it online? You know, what it not just, you know, as a consumer, what's the easiest thing to do, but if you're a business owner in that industry, what's the way that you want to be contacted? You know, to get that feedback to whether whether it's to improve or to maybe keep doing what you're doing how would you want to hear about your business and and how you're doing that's a great question i am um i might be a little bit biased because i am in the industry and stuff as far as how i handle that because i know most people um they want to they want to respond right away they you know they're mad about something or whatever a uh, good example i was a general manager of fast food chain and, uh, you know, a guy went through drive through got something wrong on his sandwich, what like that. He was really, really upset, really mad um, to the point where he actually stopped, um, um, pulled over, came inside. And now the front counter person had nothing to do with what happened in drive through but he threw the sandwich at the front person, at the, at the, kid, the front counter person, and, and was just going off, you know. So the first thing I did is I walked up to him and I said, you know, thank you, you know, and all of a sudden it just calmed him. It, it, I say calmed down, but it kind of shocked him. He's like, why? I'm, I'm coming in throwing food and all this other stuff. Why is this guy thanking me? You know, and then I said, you know, if you didn't take time out of your schedule to come in and tell us that we messed up, we wouldn't have an opportunity to fix it. You know, so part of me wants to, you know, and of course, then he was calmed down at that point, you know, and everything was fine and we moved forward. And um, but the, the point of it is, is that for me, I like to know right away, but I also know that for some people, it's better to wait, you know, uh, let them calm down a little bit and then deal with it later. Um, I'm also the type of person that, you know, I, I have called and, and, and uh, uh, made some, well, good example, the, the, the guy, uh, uh, the, the waiter that we had the other night, you know, that I was really upset about, you know, I actually pulled him aside and said, look, I said, you know, this is, this is not the way you do things. If you're not happy, well, then maybe you should have another server here, you know, uh, and stuff. The manager wasn't available, which is the reason why I talked to the server. I said, I'm still going to leave you a tip because maybe you're having a bad day, but, you know, moving forward, I'm going to try to help you here. So, um, you know, it's just th those kind of things. I, um, I also will take the time out of my day, and it's funny because I, I'll, 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 I'll call a manager over or I'll write a letter, I'll do something, you know, and, and they're like, oh my gosh, you know, we got a customer complaint or something like that. I'm like, no, 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 I just want to let you know, this server did an amazing job, and this is what 
whatever you're doing with this server needs to happen through the whole entire restaurant because they're doing a great job. And so when you look at the check and, and, and you tile things up and you see that they've got a, a, a stupid large tip, is that that's accurate. They didn't change it. I gave that to them because of this, you know. So, um, you know, it's there's a lot of different scenarios to that. But I think that I like to know right away. Um, but, you know, like I said, for some people, it's best that they calm down before they, yeah. before they uh, come up to us and give us feedback. But um, I, I do encourage anybody who's listening, though, to to please, please take time. Everyone wants to take time with negative, with negative com, um, uh, comments and bad experiences, stuff like that. But please, please, please let people know when they're doing something right. We value all that input. We value it all. You know, we want to continue to grow and continue to learn. I always tell people I'm going to learn to the day I die and maybe even later after that. I don't know. But, you know, I want to know what I've done right and what, I, what, I, what my challenges are as well. Wow, I really love that. And definitely the emphasis you put on letting people know when they get things right. Um, I, I love that, especially during all of these difficult times. Everyone's navigating it for the first time. And so to just give them a little pat on the back and say, hey, you're doing it right could help them in the long run. So I love that. Um, this, you know, we're coming to the end of our webinar for today. So I just want to thank you, Dave, for taking the time to share your professional insight with us today. Give us a little bit of insight into the hospitality industry and maybe see how we, whether we're business owners or consumers, how we can better interact in this marketplace. Um, for those listening, thank you for joining us. I want to mention that you can find other upcoming webinars and past recordings at bbbevents.org. So be sure to check out all that information there. And thank you again to those who joined us and Dave for your time. Um, we really appreciate you taking the time to chat with us today. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Yep. Thank you guys. And I hope you all have a great rest of your day. Thank <laughs> you.